All right, well, welcome back for part two of Upward. And I trust that you have uh, been blessed so far by our study. And I uh, wanted to uh, just go ahead and uh, look at our next chapter, chapter two. And um, if you are just joining us in this, uh, this new video, this challenge, uh, I um, encourage you to buy this book right here, First Steps. For New Christians by Paul Chapel, And uh, this, uh, the reason I have chosen to call our study Upward is because I am uh, not going to, uh, I'm going to continue our discipleship beyond this book, but I'm allowing this book to be a start. So I'm going to add more steps to the steps that are already being taught in this one. And uh, so the last time that I talked with you, I want to encourage you again to remember that the challenge is ultimately for you to learn to teach others also. That needs to be your motivation. You need to be ready to teach people what their lost state is. Uh, there is no reason for us really to be even doing this Bible study if you are not going to teach other people. Uh, the Bible gave us a commission. When Jesus died, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit, but when Jesus died, uh, on the cross, and then rose again. He came and he preached a, uh, 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 basically like a Bible conference for uh, for forty days, and then he ascended. Imagine being taught by Jesus for forty days. Would have, must have been wonderful. And uh, so he uh, rises and uh, rises again, goes and teaches them, and before he ascends into heaven. He gives them a commission. As a matter of fact, he gives five different types. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so we have a commission by the Lord. He says, go and make disciples. That's making people who are able to teach others also. And that's ultimately what this is about. Uh, I want to help you grow personally. I want to see you get victory in your life. And uh, I want to make sure that things in your life are prosperous. But at the same time, a life without a vision for people is not a life at all, really. And so I just want to encourage you in that area as we get ready to understand God's salvation. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for this time we can be together. And I do ask that you would just... Uh, bless uh, those that are listening right now. I pray that you would anoint these lips of clay and help me as I teach the, this next lesson. And I pray that if there's anybody that's watching this that might not know Christ as Savior, I ask that today would be the day that they trust in you. What a wonderful gift for Jesus to have died on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the book says, it begins, because we are born sinners, we are already condemned and under God's judgment. If we refuse the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our punishment as sinners is hell. Our religious works, offerings, church attendance, baptism, or any other good deeds cannot change our sinful condition before God. God displayed His love by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Because of Christ, we can come to God by faith. We can do nothing to earn salvation. It is the gift of God. We must believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and ask Him to forgive and save us by trusting in Him alone as the final payment for our sin. Now I'm going to explain a few words to you in our study as we, as we go on. Uh, because I want to make sure that you understand what they mean uh, so that they can apply and help you because these things are necessary in our spiritual growth, all right? But first of all, I want us to look at key Bible truths to understanding your salvation, understanding how to be saved, all right? Uh, God's salvation for you. First of all, we must realize that God loves us. Boy, that's so important. There's so many people who they automatically think that when uh, when we give a gospel message, we think we're trying to deliver them from hell. And really, the fact is, is we are. 
And uh, there's a lot of times where wrath is mentioned, the wrath of God. God's angry at sin, and God's going to cast people into hell, and God's going to bring judgment to the world. And, and truly, these things are so. But it's important that they, first of all, understand that God loves them. You need to understand, if you don't know for sure, if you've been born again, that God loves you. That's number one. That's the most important thing. The whole reason why we can be saved, the whole reason why it's a gift is because God loved us. That's the only way we can understand that salvation is free. There's a lot of people who think that you, can, that you have to earn your way to heaven, that you have to give a certain amount of money, that you have to be related to a certain preacher or deacon, that you have to have been dunked into some water, or that you have to do something, even pray a prayer. Uh, you know, uh, I, I've heard people say, I've prayed the prayer. And uh, I don't understand that because that is a deed. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How can we understand that it's a gift? How can we understand that salvation is full and free? It's understanding God's love. That's the first thing. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Not might, not can have it and might lose it. No, have everlasting life. Just as much as I have this book right here, and just as much as I have it, and it's in my possession, it's mine. And uh, even if somebody were to try and take it, it would still be mine. It would have been stolen. It belongs to me. Fact is, is uh, the Bible says that we are to lay, for, lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Your salvation can never be stolen. Isn't that wonderful? It's something that we own forever. 1 John 4.10 says, Herein is our love made. Here, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. What in the world does propitiation mean? That's the first word that I want us to look at, all right? Propitiation is a, it's basically God being satisfied with the payment, with the, with, with, with the payment for our sins. Somebody had to pay for the crime that was committed. That's justice. If you have a child and somebody comes and murders your child in cold blood and they catch him and you sit in the courtroom and you're waiting for the judgment to be cast on them and all of a sudden the judge says, I've known this guy since he was a little kid. I think he was having a bad day the day that he killed your son. And so I am choosing to let him go because I just think that he's a good guy for the most part. You know, he doesn't kill people all the time. He just killed your son that one day. He was having a bad day. I'm going to let him go. That wouldn't be justice. And here's the problem with, with, with our understanding of sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible also says this, and I, can, I kind of think of the coronavirus. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Sin is the transgression of the law. And if you sin, no matter what it may be, you might have told a little white lie. I hate it when they call them white lies. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where a lie has an adjective. Does it have is a, a, a black lie and a white lie? Are they any different? No. Covetousness. It comes from the heart. I could be coveting after something that you have and you wouldn't even know it. The Ten Commandments begins with the heart and ends with the heart. It starts off with idolatry. You don't know if I'm idolizing anything other than God. It's something that's deep within the heart. And then it begins to go out. By the end, it's missing church, obeying father and mother. And then it goes into... Adultery, killing, stealing, uh, you know, t uh, uh, stealing and, and, and then, you know, uh, telling a lie. Those are all very outward and obvious, but then it begins to go back in. Telling a lie that's not so obvious, 
But then you say, then you covet. That's inward. That's something that man does not notice. Sin is the transgression of the law. No matter what it is, it's sin, and it must be paid for. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It seems like we try, we try to justify and, and try to degrade and demean God and say, God, you know, I don't understand why your punishment has to be the same for everybody. Their sins are worse than mine. When the fact is, is we have a God who hates sin, period. But he loved us enough to send his son to die for us. We're not aware of what we really are capable of. So we must understand that God loves us, but also we must understand that all of us have sinned. Sin is anything that displeases God. Sin is the transgression of the law. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, I, I, I recently made a video by the same man that wrote this book right here. Uh, the man is a soul winner, and I love his material on soul winning, and I guess that's why I use it, but uh, he wrote something about the coronavirus, and I turned it into a video, and the link is bit.ly slash pandemic 323. That's where I got this from. And if you're not sure how to be saved, that will just kind of take you through and show you how that you can be saved. But this also will show you how to be saved as well. And uh, I want to just help you to understand, just to kind of understand uh, what sin really is like, all right? Just by kind of illustrating. It's an imperfect illustration, but you remember the story of the Titanic. The Titanic was the unsinkable ship, and on her maiden voyage, she was on her way to her first destination. And uh, because of some poor planning and poor navigating, they hit an iceberg and, of course, you know that the Titanic sunk. When the Titanic first entered the seas, there were first-class uh, first class sailor, or there were, there were first class passengers, second class, there were those in the, the, uh, the, the Scotland uh, Hall. And I think that's, uh, the, I can't remember exactly what that is. The, it's a level. And uh, so you've got all these different, you know, there were the underlings, the, the vermin, and then you had the really rich people. Uh, and then you had the people that were in the engine room. You had the captain. You had, very, you had various different people with various different statuses. But by the time that the, uh, the information got back to uh, New York, the New York office, uh, they put them in only two categories, the people. Saved and lost. When you die, your status is gone. You're either with the Lord, or you're in a place called hell. That's the bottom line. The worst form of badness is human goodness. We try to be good. We try somehow to earn our way to heaven, and God says you can't do that. You say, well, doesn't God appreciate my goodness? I'm going to explain that in just a minute, but I'm sure that God would love to be able to save you because of your goodness, but you are so rotten from the inside out. You have to understand this, that you cannot attain to heaven except it be by the gift of God. He paid it all. There's nothing left for you to pay. That's why Jesus Christ said on the cross, it is finished. That means there's nothing left for you to do. Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. So, you know, it's important that we understand that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. It didn't say our evil. I want you to think about that. It says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Do you know what kind of a rag it's talking about? It's talking about the rag of a leper. You don't want to touch a leper. You don't want to get near a leper. They're contagious. Leprosy is a disease that begins to take over your body and you don't even realize it. It basically breaks down the, the, the nervous system where you cannot feel anything. When you bump your arm or you break your arm or you... Uh, cut yourself. 
your body does not register that you have hurt yourself and basically it rots. It's a terrible, terrible illness and it's contagious. And our righteousnesses are as those filthy rags that lepers use to wipe away all the, the, all, all the, the refuse that comes out of their bodies. That's our righteousness. It's a terrible thing. Number three, we must recognize that death is the punishment for our sin. Death is the punishment for our sin. The government requires, when we break a law, they require punishment or payment for our disobedience. It doesn't matter whether we violate a traffic law or whether we commit murder, there is still a punishment. And the Bible says our punishment is separation from God in an eternal, in an eternal hell. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. All right, what that's saying is, is if you choose not to believe what I'm saying right now, you're already condemned. You're already on your way to hell. There's nothing that you can do to save yourself from being condemned. Do you see that? You are already condemned. If a dog has rabies, it's destroyed. It might not have bitten a human being, but the fact is, is it's capable of doing so and it needs to be put down. It's a tragic thing. What'd the dog do? He didn't do anything. Yes, but the fact is, is he already has the disease and we have sin. It's a pandemic. It's a spiritual pandemic. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. It's like a disease. Salvation is not a reward for the, righteousness, for the righteous, it is a gift for the guilty. Salvation is not a goal to be achieved, it is a gift to be received. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Number four, we must realize that Jesus Christ died to pay our price. Before we were even born, God knew that we would be sinners and unable to get to heaven. It says that God, in, in, in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us. He commended it. He showed it. He proved it to us. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All right, so now we're going to backtrack for just a little bit, all right? And I want us to look at another, all right? Salvation is the saving of a sinner from, from judgment of, of sin. Condemned. What's a person who's condemned, all right? When you get condemned in a courtroom, you're guilty. You're condemned. You're sentenced, all right? And then you, uh, you know, forgiveness is the pardon or remission of an offense. Atonement is the removal of sin or uncleanness by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your sins were atoned because Jesus shed his blood on the cross. If we have to do things by works, what was the point of him suffering such a horrible punishment on the cross, the Son of God, God Himself, hanging on the cross for our sins, being mocked by the, by the centurions, uh, uh, having the crown of thorns platted on His head and having, uh, having it pushed down on His head by a reed. What pain and agony. What undeserving punishment by our Lord. What's the point if we have to work our way? Justification is an act of free grace by which God pardons the sinner and accepts him as righteous, as righteous, holy, good on account of the atonement of Christ. Propitiation, as I already told you, is appeasement, satisfaction. God was satisfied by the death of Christ, all right? So God commendeth his love toward us in that way we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. We must believe, number five, we must believe on Jesus Christ and claim his promise of eternal life. The only righteousness that God will accept is sinless perfection. Have you ever met a perfect person? Ecclesiastes says this, there is not a righteous, there is not a good man on the earth, there is not a, a just man on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. <laughs> There's no way that any man could ever attain to perfection. All have sinned. That was accomplished 
Sinless perfection was accomplished by Jesus Christ. He was spotless. He was the perfect, spotless, holy Lamb of God, and he took our sins on himself. Romans 3.22 says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Romans 10.10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Do you know that you're a sinner? Do you realize that you're a sinner? I've talked to hundreds of people about this. I want you to listen to me now. I want you to understand that the Bible is authoritative. And I love you, and that's the reason why I'm doing this. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to understand that if you're listening to this and you're saying, yeah, yeah, I know I'm a sinner and all this stuff, it's probably best that it's on a video that you're watching because the fact is, is there's a lot of people who listen and they agree with it, but it's not really in their heart to receive Him. It's one of those, yeah, I, I know Jesus died for me, but I, I just... I'd rather not. That's not enough. We have to depend on Jesus to save us. We have to realize that there was nothing that we could do on our own. It was all because of Jesus. It was only Jesus. Do you know what it means to believe and confess that Jesus is Lord? It literally means that you agree with God. See, you don't have to agree uh, you can read the Bible and you can study it, and you can, you, but you don't. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have that. You, that's that's what it means to confess that Jesus is Lord. You're saying He is Lord. I believe that He's Lord. There are only two ways to be saved. If you live a sinless life, which no one can do except Jesus, or you can ask Jesus to take the payment of your sin, which He did already long ago. People say, well, you know, doesn't suicide take you to hell? <laughs> I've had that question asked so many times. Can I tell you something? Jesus died for you 2,000 years before you were born. Did you do anything wrong then? No, not yet. You haven't done anything. He died for you as a sinner. Is suicide wrong? Yes. Do you think God's going to be happy when he sees you in heaven after you took your life? No, he's not. But... He's still going to receive you. He may not approve of everything you do, but if you are born again, if you are a child of God, He will always accept you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. See, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You have to understand that in order for you to receive salvation and eternal life, God has to look at you as if you'd never, ever sinned. Not that you are doing whatever you can to work your way out of sin. Going to confession. Doing good deeds. Making sure that you're cleaned up. No, God has to look at you as though you had never sinned in your entire life. How does that happen? When Jesus puts his righteousness, it says it in the Bible, for he hath made him to be sin for us. So God looked at Jesus and instead of seeing Jesus, the righteous lamb of God, he put our sin on him and God saw him as us and poured his wrath upon his own son. And when he looked at us now, when, if we chose to trust in Christ as our savior, he looks at us as though we'd never sinned. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God's requirements are simple. He asks us to believe on Jesus Christ and to call upon him for salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth Confession is made into salvation. The mouth is that I believe this. I believe these things. Uh, I, I'm a witness. You know, one of the, 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 the thing that, that really interests me about uh, people that are believers, you know, people say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I believe in Jesus. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know we, we call people believers. Do you know, the Bible only has, in the New Testament, you only see the word believer twice. Do you know how many times you see the word disciple? 231 times in the New Testament. 
We were made to teach others. We were made to proclaim. We were made to unashamedly say, hey, Jesus changed my life. Saying a prayer and your life not changing, it's just one of those things that, you know, God has got, God has to have done something that you want to tell people about. You have to understand what he's done. Do you understand that he took away your sin? Do you understand that he paid the price for you? Do you understand that, that you have been saved from an eternal hell? Guess what? Because of it, you've got something to tell people. I want you to listen to this. This is a really interesting story. A man by the name of George Wilson in 1829 was sentenced to be hanged in the state of Pennsylvania for murder. For whatever reason, President Andrew Jackson pardoned Wilson. When the pardon was presented to Wilson, he refused it. As a result, Wilson was hung by the neck until dead, even though a pardon had been offered. What an amazing story. Do you know that that's exactly what God did for you? You were guilty. I think it's possible that Wilson said, I'm not guilty of anything. But the fact is, is he was proven guilty. He was found and sentenced in a courtroom to death, to be hanged until dead in a courtroom because of a deed that he had done. And he says, but, but I don't see myself as guilty. I remember I talked to a lady and I shared with her the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I told her, do you believe? She said, yes. And she asked the Lord to save her. And when she said, amen, she looked up at me and she said, I still don't believe that I'm guilty. I still don't believe I'm a sinner. And basically, when you don't realize that you forfeited everything that Jesus Christ did for you, in order to receive the good news, you have to hear the bad news first. That's how we... That's, that's how we're saved. You know, I would say that you should pray a prayer like this and kind of take you through a, a prayer. But if you've never received Jesus Christ, I want you to just talk to him personally. If you need to write down this prayer, write it down. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, if you truly realize from the heart that you're a sinner, if you realize that if you were to die any moment that you'd be in hell and you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, all you have to do is tell him that you know you're a sinner, that you also know that Jesus died for you, that he paid the price for your sins, died, was buried, and rose again, conquering death for you, and is now seated on the right hand of God. You realize that. And all you do is ask him to save you. You say, Lord, I believe. And he will save you. Make a prayer. Write it down. Tell him what you want to tell him. Believe in your heart and say, Lord, save me. And he will. I trust this was a blessing to you. And uh, those of you who have already been born again, this is a way that you can present the gospel with somebody else. And I encourage you to do that. There's uh, materials available for you. If you go to my church, we have plenty of gospel tracts in Spanish and in English. And I encourage you to be a part of our soul winning program and tell people what God has done for you in sending his son to die for you. Have a great day.